What is the number one requirement to attain true freedom? I will explain to you what one of the greatest pieces of literature in the world has to say about the nature of true freedom. One of the highest teachings in the world, if not the highest, and the text that somewhat goes beyond a lot of other texts in all of spiritual world literature is the Zhuangzi text. Now, Zhuangzi is an ancient Taoist sage, and I would say that this is the greatest Taoist book in the world, even higher than the Tao Te Ching because of the teachings are so advanced. And that's why a lot of people say that Zhuangzi's teachings are for the spiritual elite. So mainly meant for sages and realized masters. But we have the text for us and for all of us. And this is a translation that I highly recommend by Burton Watson. And even Burton Watson's introduction is amazing in this text. And his translation is absolutely on point in the Zhuangzi. And Burton Watson actually produced many great translations. Think of Cold Mountain as one, the great Zen Taoist master. His translation of Cold Mountain, Han Shan, is an amazing translation. Burton Watson really understood the heart of particularly Far East Asian thought. And ironically, he lived a lot of his life in Far East Asia, where he eventually died in Japan. And so this book, The Complete Works of the Zhuangzi, is every chapter of the Zhuangzi text. It's not just the inner chapters where you'll see a lot of texts that just have the inner chapters of Zhuangzi. This is the complete works and it has great commentary. As I said, brilliant introduction, but it's the essence of the teachings that's most important, obviously. And the Zhuangzi is a book that I would highly recommend for anyone to give to a teenager, for example. This is almost a requirement before coming an adult if you want your children to understand what the nature of true freedom is. And if you want them to be a peaceful and understanding individual, this is the text. This is the one, but it's very confusing. Even if you give it to an adult, they don't really understand it. And the teachings are really hard to understand because Zhuangzi himself, being a Taoist, runs counter to socialization. And so that is why Taoism in general has never been taken on lock stock with all of the masses because it runs counter to what we ordinarily think of morality, politics, society, and freedom in general where Zhuangzi pulls the rug from underneath us and shows us the way, shows us what true morality is, what true society is, and ultimately what true freedom is. Now, in the Zhuangzi text, when he mentions freedom, he mentions Xiao Yao Yu. Now, Xiao Yao Yu is free and easy wandering. Now, this is the ultimate teaching of Zhuangzi, but you could translate that in many ways, not just free and easy wandering. You could translate that as wandering beyond the borders of your mind, and also a mind that is immersed in the oneness of Tao. And so this free and easy wandering is ultimately an ease that one develops when we progress on the spiritual path. But it's something that we can have right now, but we don't. And so this ease, this free and easy wandering, is what a lot of people would say the fragrance of enlightenment, the fragrance of a realized master. And when you read these teachings and you understand what free and easy wandering is, this immersion and oneness, you actually realize that Zhuangzi is an island unto himself, as opposed to most other spiritual masters who are the product of the tradition that they are part of, the lineage that they are part of, the location that they are part of. But Zhuangzi is a complete outlier. And that's why I highly recommend his teachings because his teachings, if you understand these teachings, it will help you understand other deep teachings better. It'll help you understand Advaita Vedanta better. It'll help you understand the Shaiva Siddhanta better. It'll help you understand Vajrayana Buddhism better, etc. And a lot of other non-dual and integral non-dual teachings, you will understand a lot better if you understand Zhuangzi because like I said, he's an island unto himself. And so as I mentioned, Xiao Yao Yu, this is that ultimate freedom that we are seeking. But Zhuangzi says that we need to make a step towards this. Now, this step is difficult. Now, this step we find in other spiritual traditions before we get to that stage, but he articulates it in a way that is on point. 
And so what I want to read to you is actually from the introduction of the Zhuangzi from Burton Watson about this first step towards freedom, this requirement that we need to live by so that we can embody Xiao Yao Yu. The central theme of the Zhuangzi may be summed up in a single word, freedom. Essentially, all the philosophers of ancient China addressed themselves to the same problem. How is man to live in a world dominated by chaos, suffering, and absurdity? Nearly all of them answered with some concrete plan of action designed to reform the individual, to reform society, and eventually to free the world from its ills. The proposals put forward by the Confucians, the Moas, and the Legalists, to name some of the principal schools of philosophy, are all different, but are all based upon the same kind of common sense approach to the problem and all seek for concrete social, political, and ethical reforms to solve it. Zhuangzi's answer, however, the answer of one branch of the Taoist school, is radically different from these, and is grounded upon a wholly different type of thinking. It is the answer of a mystic, and in attempting to describe it here in clear and concrete language, I shall undoubtedly be doing violence to its essential mystic and indescribable nature. Zhuangzi's answer to the question is, free yourself from the world. Now, there are many layers to what Zhuangzi means here, free yourself from the world. He's not mentioning it just in the sense of freeing yourself from the world, but it's much deeper than that. It's more internal than it is external, as you would expect with Zhuangzi. And so, as you may know, Zhuangzi lived in the world. He was not like Lao Tzu, who left the society and lived out in nature, Zhuangzi was part of a society and he lived in it, but his mind was completely detached from worldliness, like most great spiritual masters. And his first step towards that type of freedom, that free and easy wandering, is best explained in a story in the Zhuangzi, where we come across what he actually means by freeing yourself from the world. Now, in the Zhuangzi, when we come to section 23, there is a story about Nanjiang Chu who went to visit the great Taoist master Lao Tzu to resolve all of his concerns and worries. So he went and traveled, he went to find Lao Tzu. And then the way that this story goes is very humorous in typical Zhuangzi fashion, but deep. So when Nanjiang Chu found Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu asked him straight away, why did you come with all of this crowd of people? And Nanjiang Chu quickly turns around to see if there was a crowd of people following him behind him but there was nobody there. Now, what Lao Tzu is saying here is that the crowd of people are like baggage within his mind. And this is what Lao Tzu is pointing to. Lao Tzu is obviously the mouthpiece of Zhuangzi in the text. And so what Lao Tzu is saying to Nang Zhang Chu is that the baggage and all of these people that are kind of weighing him down and are behind him are all of the old ideas and beliefs that one holds onto, all of these conventional social values and the idea of right and wrong, good and bad, life and death. Now, you need to remember, Zhuangzi doesn't have a negative opinion of death. He s says to us that, why should you even be concerned about death? You don't even really know what it is, and we're running around all day long in fear of death. He would be aghast when looking at all of the longevity people in the modern day. He would look at that with a very curious smirk and think it was just ridiculous because when you're so obsessed with longevity and so obsessed with not dying, you're doing one thing. You're not living. And that's what Zhuangzi would say. And so Lao Tzu is saying to Nan Zhong Chu here that this is all baggage. All of these conventional ideas of right and wrong, life and death, good and bad, your belief systems and this and that, this is something that weighs you down and blocks you from experiencing true freedom. And so it's like a heavy weight that we all carry around and it's an internal thing that we carry right it's not something external we use the nama rupa to use buddhist and hindu sanskrit name and form to dissect the world up into this and that built on our conditioning which then eclipses the true nature of the world because we're looking at the world through rose-colored glasses we're not really seeing the true nature of the world and hence we become our own prisoner within our own mind and this is what Lao Tzu is saying 
He's saying that all of this idea of right and wrong, good and bad, these social values, this moral system that you've taken on, which is obviously different to another part of the world, weigh you down and block and eclipse the true nature of freedom and keep you actually a prisoner within yourself. So to be free, we must discard all of these conventional beliefs and our way of dissecting the world up into this and that before we can even talk about freedom, before we can even taste free and easy wandering, shall yao yu. We need to discard all of that. That's the first step. And some people don't want to make that step on the spiritual path, but it is the number one requirement. Now, you don't want to confuse this that Zhuangzi actually doesn't see suffering and he doesn't see the man-made ills of war, violence, poverty, and justice. He sees those just as Confucius and Malta and Mencius did during the Warring States period of China. And he saw also the natural ills such as death and disease. But his perspective was completely different than those of the other warring states philosophers. He believed that all of those were only ills because we see them as such. We decide what is good and bad in our mind. And that's why they are ills. That's why we see them as right and wrong, good and bad. And so we build this within our mind. We build a projection of what we feel is right or wrong within ourselves. And we project that onto the world because we see certain things in the world and we judge it accordingly. Burton Watson actually elaborates beautifully on this about this propensity to label things according to right and wrong, good and bad, our conventional values and standards, which actually get in the way of what true freedom actually is. If man would once forsake his habit of labeling things good or bad, desirable or undesirable, then the man-made ills, which are the product of man's purposeful and value-ridden actions, would disappear and the natural ills that remained would no longer be seen as ills, but as an inevitable part of the course of life. I absolutely love this quote by Burton Watson, and it actually encapsulates Zhuangzi's thinking about this. And so it's a radical way of thinking, right? As Zhuangzi mentions that we're so obsessed with these labels, like there's poverty, there's war, there's this, there's that. We have natural ills of disease and death. So we're always in a state of security and protection. And we're actually not living because our projections and our conditioning is what is getting in the way of true freedom. And his point here is that if we all saw the world like that, then obviously things like war and violence and all of that would begin to dissipate because we'd be seeing the world clearly. We wouldn't be seeing it through our ego or through our mask, and we would be able to see the world according to how it is, not according to how your conditioning perceives it. And so Zhuangzi clearly states that we are the author of our own life. We are the author of our own suffering and our own bondage. And all of our fears then spring from the web of values that we have created for ourselves. And so that's an aspect a lot of us don't think about. We are the author of our own suffering, our own bondage, according to our own cultural and social conditioning. And so that's the big problem, right? We are dissecting the world up into this and that according to that conditioning and deciding what is right and wrong according to the labels that we have ascribed to what we see. So in section 12 of the Zhuangzi, Zhuangzi sums up all of this fear-struck condition of mankind with an interesting story about a leper woman. And in classical Zhuangzi fashion, he's using humor. He's trying to shock you with these stories to bring you back into the irrational mind, to get you out of rationality so you can see the nature of reality. Not through your intellect, but more intuitively, more natural. And so the leper woman gives birth to a child in the night. And so she quickly grabs a torch in terror to see if the child looks like her. And so what's the meaning of this story? What is the problem that the leper woman has? She is a victim of the labels of ugly and beauty. And these labels in nature have no real validity. That's what we need to recognize, right? They have no real validity. The only way they have validity is when we subscribe to them and we use those labels to dissect the reality. And so the problem here is how are we to persuade the leper woman that disease and ugliness are mere labels with no validity? How can we persuade people that these labels have no validity? And that's the first step towards freedom, right? 
is getting rid of these labels, not being fear struck by these labels, not conditioning ourselves according to the labels, nor conditioning the world according to the labels that we have playing in our mind. And so that's the task for all of us. It's not an easy task, right? And this is the challenge that Zhuangzi poses to humanity, to not live through the labels, to not live through the condition lens. This is what he is proposing to us. Can we really do it? Can we identify how we dissect the world? And can we do it to the point that it affects our habits and tendencies towards the world? Not just an intellectual exercise where we say, okay, that's that's not ugly and that's not beautiful, but actually a real felt sense of that experience, right? That you don't live through the labels. That's the challenge. A lot of people will pay lip service to that type of philosophy and say, I don't see any of the labels. But then when you pressure test them, they obviously do see the labels and it's just lip service. And so Zhuangzi would laugh at those type of people because to attain this, we have to take the first step sincerely And when we take that first step and we abide by that, then that will open the door to true and real freedom. Shao Yao Yo. And so that's the challenge that Zhuangzi is throwing down to all of us. Unlike all of the other philosophers during the Warring States period of China who were mainly focused on political and social means for the political and social elite, Zhuangzi is addressing the spiritual elite. Maybe you watching this, maybe you listening to this, maybe you are the spiritual elite and you can hear the essence of Zhuangzi's message. And so guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm gonna do more dialogues on the Zhuangzi because I feel it's probably the most important book in the world, particularly if you wanna understand the depths of spirituality and live by the tenets of what spiritual path you follow. The Zhuangzi is an essential requirement for any spiritual aspirant. So I'll continue to do more dialogues on the Zhuangzi. Please leave a comment below. Let me know what you think about Zhuangzi and what you think about this content in general. And guys, I hope you're all safe and sound and I'll see you guys in the next video. Shanti, shanti, shanti.